I love my mom because she helps us through the rough times. I love my mom because she's so kind and she loves us so much. Um, I like my mom because she takes really good care of us and I like how she is really playful. I love that she never gives up and never lets anything or anyone drag her down. And that she's funny and she's the strongest person I know. And that she's, she's the, the best, best mom, mom in the world. Happy Mother's Day. Day. You are the best mom ever. I love, love you, Mom. Love you, Mom. Thanks for taking care of us, and we all love you. Thank you, Mom. Oh. <laughs> I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. Hi, hi Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for helping me all these years. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Love you, Mom. Mwah. What I like about mom is that she paints pictures with us and does arts and crafts. Um, what I like about mommy, she reads silly books to me. And Danny, what do you like about mommy? Cuddling. <laughs> Good he likes cuddling, mommy. All right, let's say Happy Mother's Day. Happy, happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. I love going shopping with my mom because it's just kind of like a girl time, I guess. We kind of go do our own separate things in the store, but it's always fun to like, for her to criticize what I want to buy. She shows that she loves me by caring for me and helping me when I need help. Even though I can be um, annoying, she can still sometimes be patient with me. Like at her job, she works really hard. Like that's, she just seems like a really like powerful kind of person. It's like she, has worked really hard to earn everyone's respect and like she's really like important. Happy Mother's Day! Okay, thank you. Good morning and happy Sunday. I got something in my nose. Hold on. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today and uh, thank you for that, for the gift that we have to glorify you. And we pray for your peace in this time. Um, and we glorify you in song. In Jesus' name, amen.
sky be rolled back as a scroll. The drum shall resound and the Lord shall exist. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, but this blessed assurance can control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and death shed. His own blood for my song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. Um, I know you've been told this multiple times already this morning, but thank you for the sacrifice you make uh, every day for us. Um, We literally would not be here without you. We appreciate you. Thank you for waking up each and every day and choosing to love, even when it's hard. You know, I did some extensive research this last week, and I came to find out that being a mom has been a difficult job since Eve gave birth to Cain, (laughs) and that was a long time ago. So thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for teaching us what long-suffering looks like, uh, what grace looks like, what patience looks like. Thank you for your love, the support that you give us. Uh, We appreciate you, and I hope that all of our mothers today would find a very restful day, um, that it would be filled with laughter, and that it would be filled with joy. Um, you know, speaking of today, we're going to be getting into our fourth minor prophet this morning, Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah is the tiniest book in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's 21 verses. The only two books tinier than this are, are found in the New Testament, um, and that's First and Second John. But man, this book is tiny. And um, recent studies have shown that it's also the least read book in the entire Bible. So 
Uh, maybe you haven't read through it before, um, but I just want to give us some framework as we approach it this morning to really help us understand what it's trying to say. Um, and as we read through this book, a really important theme to help us through it is this theme of the kingdom. And I know that we've talked about this a lot um, already, but it's, it's such an important thread to understand while reading through the scriptures that we're just going to we're just going to talk about it again this morning. We can trace this idea of the kingdom all the way back to Genesis 1 through 3. That in the beginning is this good creator God who has made the world that we exist in. And he called his creation good. And he made us. And, and he made us with this hope and this intention to enjoy his, his good creation alongside him as human partners. And, and he crowns humanity with this crown of glory and honor and we have this immense responsibility in God's good world to see God as the as the good creator king and to come under his submission and because it's only when humans are in right relationship with God that they can rule in God's good world faithfully and rightly and so this is where this theme of kingdom begins that God deeply desires to walk with human beings that he crowns humanity as image bearers and kings and queens over his creation. He desires to be in relationship with them, to create and extend his kingdom, to rule over his good creation. And you can, you can trace this theme of the kingdom, really, from the beginning of Scripture all the way to the end of the Bible. We, we ended our trek just a short time ago through the New Testament talking about the kingdom in Revelation 21. This is, this is a thread that goes through the entire word. Uh, But we know how it begins and we know what happens directly after it's introduced in chapter 3 of Genesis. Things, they fall apart. Humanity tries to usurp God's throne and take it upon themselves to define good and evil on their own terms and, and they forfeit what God has given them and they attempt to rule in creation apart from God and there's this fracture that takes place, right? Of of heaven and earth, and, and this moves us into Revelation 11 where we just see the fall culminating, the, the, the fall culminating in this city, the, the city of Babylon. And, and the humans rebel against their good creator and they set up their own kingdom. And this is what Babylon is. Babylon is just the epitome of pride. It's a kingdom that's come about through violence and oppression, through slave labor, and it's marked by these things by these things and and humans break away from God and his established kingdom in the garden and they attempt to rule and to reign outside of relationship with him and this is where Babylon is born this broken human kingdom model becomes a huge player through the entire Bible and it's it's a big deal and Obadiah introduces us to another one of these kingdoms in Obadiah, the kingdom of Edom. So let's just jump into Obadiah 1 through 5 real quick. And you'll see it here. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. And so Obadiah just introduces us to this, to to just another proud human kingdom that has been formed. And this is centuries later, but the pride of their heart has deceived them. This is such a key verse for this book. And Edom is this unique kingdom for many reasons. And I just want to highlight a couple of them for you this morning. You know, you can go anywhere uh, in the world and really at any point in history and you will find people that swear allegiance to some type of deity or God that they depend on. They swear allegiance to a God. And, and, and what's interesting is that 
scholars have never found a record of dependence or a record of any Edomite giving allegiance to any god. And this has led many scholars to believe that um, this unusual people were so self-sufficient, they were so arrogant, they were so self-satisfied that they were the, the first truly secular nation. They didn't feel a need for anyone or anything at all outside of themselves. They believed that they had all the answers. And so, I mean, that's the epitome of pride, right? <laughs> and their kingdom was unique as well in its location. The central area of Edom was this red sandstone cliffs that rose up to 5,000 feet high and was easily fortified. Perhaps you've seen pictures of modern-day Petra, Jordan. This is, this is their ancient home. This was Edom, and this is where they lived, and it's just this incredibly impenetrable fortress. And experts say that 12 men could have held against an entire army if they attacked because of, the lo- of, of their location. And it's no wonder that the Edomites said to them, of themselves then, who can bring us down to the ground? You know, just this amazing statement of pride. They thought themselves untouchable nestled in this fortress-like city and, and they were deceived by their own invincibility. And apparently God will have nothing to do with this. And, 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 not that, and not only that, but he will undo it. In verse 4, he says, I will bring you down, declares the Lord. And this is where we pick up the theme of kingdom right here. That God is approaching this prideful kingdom on the earth and he's saying, your days are numbered. This is much later than Genesis 1-3 through and Babylon and, and Genesis 11. This is much later, but you should see this thread and you should have this thread in your mind as you read through Obadiah. And I was thinking about this this week and, and trying to think of ways to explain this that might help us read Obadiah and just uh, turn on some light bulbs for us. And I realized that this dynamic of human kingdoms is actually happening in my own home and probably in yours as well almost every day. You know, we have nine kids, um, and I remember the day that each one of them came into our house. Uh, I remember remodeling each one of the rooms and painting them and getting stuff to put in them and and make them welcoming. You know, we got our, our, our boys this... Uh, Lego table when we, when we put posters on their wall. We filled their beds with stuffed animals. We got the, our younger girls bed sheets that had flamingos on them and, and put flowers on the wall. We got new beds for our older girls and remodeled their entire room and got a desk and, and got little cactuses and put rad curtains on their windows and we just made their room look awesome. And we stepped back and we saw that it was good. Right, And then we invited them into our home, and it was our joy to give them dominion in their rooms. You know, It was our joy. We said, here is your area. Have fun. Play like it's yours. If you need anything, let us know. And here's how you should exist in your little kingdom. Be kind to one another. Pick up after yourself. Be grateful. Take care of the things you've been given. Steward them well. You know, all of these things just... To, to help them be successful in enjoying the room and, and respecting it. And, you know, over the past five years, we've had some really good days. We, we have. When our kids submit to the rules they've been given to maintain their healthy little mini kingdom, it's awesome. They play together. They pick up their, f- or they build forts. They, they, they make Lego creations. They read. They draw. They invite friends in. They laugh. Um, they're grateful for all they have. It's just great. But then there's other days where it just seems like everything breaks down and it's, it's just really not good. <laughs> and we have a cat, you know, so throw a beast in the field in the mix and, and it can just get crazy. And on a smaller scale, it can just become, well, Obadiah, verses 10 through 14. Let's read this. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob... Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. 
But do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah and the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity or the, loot his wealth in the day of his calamity or do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. What is going on here? God is judging Edom for the way that they've treated Judah. There's two kingdoms in the story and they're actually related. They're the two kingdoms that come from the descendants of Jacob and Esau. Um, Jacob and Esau were the grandsons of Abraham, the sons of Isaac. Um, and you want to talk about sibling ri rivalry. They had it. On the day that they were born, Esau came out first. And when Jacob appeared moments later, he was clutching Esau's heel in this effort to even just try to get ahead of his sibling in the womb. And this just becomes a foreshadowing of their troubled relationship. And their parents did not help in this at all. Their, their father favored Esau because he was a man's man. He was a skillful hunter. He could probably throw a football over a mountain range, you know. And their mom doted on the younger Jacob who liked to stay home and cook. And, and Jacob competed for, with his brother for uh, his father's affection and, and blessing. And, and as the boys grew up into young men, eventually Jacob tricked Esau in signing over the family birthright in exchange for a bowl of stew. It's a crazy, really gut-wrenching story, if you think about it. And the brother's worst episode, though, of sibling rivalry is, came when Jacob tricked their elderly blind father Isaac into giving him the all-important covenant blessing. Jacob dresses up in his brother's clothes. He ties goat skins to his arm to mimic Esau's hairiness. He must have been incredibly hairy, I guess. He fed his father the requested meal of wild game, all with the encouragement and the help of his mother, Rebecca, who openly favored Jacob over Esau. And when Esau later discovered what his brother had done, he vowed to kill him. And this actually caused Jacob to flee for Haran and live for 20 years. And what we learn eventually is that there is this moment of, of reconciliation where they meet on the road 20 years later with their families. And Esau has 400 men with him. And you kind of think that blood is going to be spilled, but really just tears are exchanged. And these two brothers, they seem to, to just make amends. But eventually, what we find is that they grow into these two rivaling kingdoms. The descendants of Esau would become known as the Edomites, and, and Jacob, of course, the Israelites, or, or Judah here. And so here we are centuries later, and we're stuck in this sibling drama, and things have gotten dark. Edom, at this point, has totally rejected God. And Babylon, the fallen human kingdom that we learned about in Genesis 11, had just come into Judah and ransacked and pillaged and destroyed it, literally, to the ground. And the worst part about this is that instead of mourning for their brother nation, the Edomites rejoiced in Judah's destruction and actually became allies with Babylon and aided in the destruction, the pillaging of Judah. So instead of helping their brother and their family member, they capitalized on their misery. And it was just like this still steal, kill, and destroy mentality, right? Alongside Babylon. And now obviously, I'm not saying at all that our home is at extreme, but if you think about it, this is what can happen in our houses all the time. You know, on a good day, it's, it's unbelievable when our kids can, what, what our kids can do to love each other and to, you know, just enjoy uh, just laughing together and um, it's, it's great. We, we absolutely love our family. But man, on the bad days, it's like steal, kill, and destroy, you know? And I have some stories I could tell you, but I, I, I just respect my kids uh, too much to go there. But things can get bad, can't they? And if you're a parent, you, you know this, that things can get bad. 
that a quiet, peaceful household can turn into this screaming match. And mom, which used to be this beautiful word of endearment and respect, is now just thrown around as this word used when anybody is angry or seeking revenge, you know? <laughs> uh, happy Mother's Day. It happens, it happens quite a bit. And so here in Obadiah, we're just seeing this sibling rivalry that happens, you know, that we can experience in our home playing out on a national level. Jacob and Esau grew up and their sibling rivalry turned into these two clashing kingdoms. Because really, if, if sin goes unchecked, this is where it will lead us. This is the condition of humanity. This is the condition of the human heart. This is where pride will lead us. And, and part of grasping and placing Obadiah is understanding and, and tuning into this biblical theme of kingdom and how humans will inevitably give birth to proud and violent human kingdoms if sin goes unchecked. Can you think of any kingdom today that's been founded on violence, whose systems are inherently against one or more group of people, who, uh, that is racked with oppression or, and poverty or injustice? Is this still a thing today? Yes, this is very much in our world today. That's what Obadiah's world look like, and, and this is still in our world today. Because a fundamental core in the story of the Bible is that humans have rebelled against the good creator God and set up their own kingdom, and in pride, they have been deceived. And, you know, they think it's going to work. And it's not going to work. Not only is it not going to work, Again, as we read in verse 4, God will unravel it. He will not have it. And this doesn't just apply to the Edomites. In verse 15, Obadiah, he broadens his view to all of the nations of the world when he writes this. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continuously. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. Not only will God unravel it, but God speaks this word of judgment. That as these human kingdoms have perpetuated violence and injustice within the kingdom and against other kingdoms, that measure, he says, that we've extended to our fellow human will be measured against us. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. This is an indictment against all of humanity that all the kingdoms of the earth will one day fall under this judgment that stand proud you know, and opposed, separate from the holy God of eternity. And I, this is just speaking of the day of the Lord that we read about in Joel. And remember what Joel says, that the day of the Lord is great and awesome. Who can endure it? And we answered this question two weeks ago. No one can endure it. No one can stand on this day of judgment. But remember in every prophecy we've looked at so far, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance because he's got something better for us. His judgment isn't about condemnation. It's about illumination so that people can, can have their eyes opened and so they can turn from their sin and know his comfort and know his forgiveness and his blessing. And, and we've seen this through the prophets, haven't we? Just think back to Hosea. Remember this Wife, once lost in shame, now reconciled to her beloved husband and bought back, redeemed. Remember in Joel, a nation once ravaged by a locust plague. Um, it's now restored and it's fruitful. And we saw last week in Amos, the promise that God made to his people completely ruined by sin. That they would now be raised from the ruins and rebuilt like in the days of old. Because God is committed to his world. 
He has made it and he has said that it is good. He loves his earth. He loves humanity. He is 100% committed to fulfilling all that he has promised and establishing his kingdom once again. And this is where we come to in the end of Obadiah. This is Obadiah 17. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Joseph, a flame. The house of Esau, stubble. They shall burn them and consume them. And there shall be no survivors for the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. And then jumping down to verse 21. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Obadiah just has this vision, this beautiful vision of one day all of the proud and violent and arrogant kingdoms of the earth falling away and the one kingdom that's left and that will reign forever is the Lord's. It's beautiful. The the entirety of the kingdom is the Lord's. God is committed to having a kingdom. He is He's committed to having a kingdom and his kingdom is good it, and it will be his. And just think, if you're living in an oppressed nation, think about the hope that this would bring. That God, God's kingdom will come. That inevitably the kingdom that you're in right now, it will be unraveled. It will. And the only one in the end that will be standing is the Lord's. And he is a good God. You know, through the whole Old Testament, you just feel, you can almost feel this hunger and this thirst for God's kingdom to to just show up onto the scene. You know, God's covenant family is ravaged. They are lost in exile. The surrounding kingdoms are at each other. It's it's, it's just a mess. And, and, And I can just imagine the people saying, God, when, when will your, when will this happen? When will your kingdom come? It will be yours, but when will it be yours? You know, this was Obadiah's hope that all of the wrongs would be made right. That God's kingdom would come. And this is where his prophecy ends. Uh, But the beautiful thing that we have today is we get to live in a different position than Obadiah did because we stand on the other side of the cross. If we move forward in time to when Jesus shows up onto the scene, what, what's the phrase that is first and foremost on his lips? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In Matthew 4, Jesus has just gotten out of the 40 days in the wilderness. He's been victorious over, over the temptation with the devil the accuser, and he comes out and he starts proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then we pick up here in Matthew 4, 23. And he went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Assyria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee to the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem to Judea, and, fr- and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, 
for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do, you. do you see here that the hope of Obadiah is here? Jesus is announcing the good news that God's kingdom has finally come, just like the prophet of old said. Jesus wasn't mounting this, re- this violent rebellion either to make this happen. Because we know who rebels violently against other nations. It's proud human kingdoms do that. That's not how God inaugurates his kingdom. And we learn this as, as we keep reading through his story and his ministry and his life. And, and we remember in Obadiah where, where the proud human kingdoms will be brought down. They will be unraveled in this judgment. As you have done, so it will be done to you. And, and what we learn is that Jesus himself, in the midst of this proud kingdom Rome, in the midst of all of this sin, what he does in inaugurating the kingdom is he takes the judgment on behalf of all the nations. The judgment that's due over all the nations. The judgment that is due over humanity. Jesus himself shoulders it on the cross. This is what Paul tells us in Colossians 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. I just want you to think about this. The kingdom that Jesus came up in, the Roman Empire, at that time there was no one greater There was no one more advanced. There was no one more sophisticated. And Jesus just exposed the hollowness of their empire. That God himself entered into humanity in Jesus as a truly innocent, perfect human. And what did this advanced civilization, this advanced progressive Babylon human kingdom do to Jesus? They murdered him. But the Apostle Paul says that on the cross, that Jesus put these kingdoms to shame. These human kingdoms that, th- that, that thought themselves so strong and so wise. Because on the cross, he exposed what they were really about. What was at the core of these kingdoms. How these kingdoms operated and how they functioned and and what they, were build, what they were built on, it was all exposed at the cross. In an utter paradox, Jesus' death becomes his victory over proud human kingdoms. And at his resurrection, he is seated as king of eternity. Paul says that Jesus canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands on the cross. That he nailed all of that judgment that had legal demand over our lives, that he nailed it to the cross, which means that we can be forgiven. It means that we can be freed from our sin. He is the exact opposite of a proud human kingdom, of proud human rulers. Jesus is the good, humble king who gave his life for the world to save the world from itself. And now he invites the world in to himself to follow him and find life. To live as kingdom citizens of heaven. And, and what does this look like? Well, Paul shows us in Philippians 2. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though He was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the king, but he is a different type of king. He's not a proud king. He's not a violent king. He is the humble king of eternity. And he loves us deeply. And we are no greater than our master. Jesus shows us the way of his kingdom through his life and through the cross. And and so remember Obadiah. Remember this is the condition of our world. That it's not hard to find ourselves participating in or being run over by a proud human kingdom because this is the reality of our world. And the, and the hope that Obadiah had that these kingdoms would fall, that God would unravel the system of, an, of injustice and oppression, of violence and stealing and killing and destroying, that God would put an end to it, that judgment would come, that the rights would be made wrong, that, and that God's kingdom, his eternal everlasting kingdom would come and be established. This is exactly what Paul is talking about in Philippians 2. That all of this began and culminated in Jesus. That that the kingdom of God was inaugurated in, in his coming. That he has begun the process of restoring all things. And today, that we are invited to participate in that restoration until his return. When all things will be made new again. And you know, I know the illustration I gave of my kids and their mini little kingdom. It can, it can seem funny to think about, but if we're honest, it's the same. It's, it's true for all of us, isn't it? This steal, kill, destroy mentality is a product of the fall and it's something that we need to recognize will find its furthest end in us if it goes unchecked, if we do not turn from it. And today, Obadiah and King Jesus would call us to abandon our pride, and embrace humility. Because humility is the defining trademark of God's kingdom. Humility is the way of Christ. It's the way that Jesus has called us to. So in light of this coming kingdom that we celebrate today and that we can live in, we should humble ourselves. We should humble ourselves before the Lord to whom belongs the kingdom, that our sin may be checked and that he may lift us to escape the fall which pride inevitably brings. This is what he calls us to in his grace. And you know, my heart has been so heavy all week for Maud Arbery and his family a young black man who was murdered in broad daylight while jogging near his home in Georgia. And I was thinking about it this morning that, you know, this will be the first time his mother will face Mother's Day without her son because there are people in this world that choose to judge someone by the color of their skin instead of the content of their character. Uh, racism to me is the epitome of the fall. It, it just is. That we could ever look at another human made in the image of God who bears a unique color of his glory through the beauty of their skin and treat them with anything with respect and dignity and awe really is beyond me. It's an unthinkable injustice and evil. And it's something that us as the children of God, us as citizens of this new inaugurated kingdom of Jesus, we need to be conscious about that we need to be participating in reconciling these wrongs in the ways that we can. And, you know, praise God that one day the only kingdom that will stand is the Lord's. But until that day, may we be a people who stand up for justice, who are a voice for the oppressed, who love people like Jesus and walk humbly with our King for his glory and our good. 
Let's pray. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. All things come from you and you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. So God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. We praise you for sending your son to establish what we can never do ourselves. To establish a kingdom that leads us to life and not death. We thank you for staying true to your promises. The words that you've spoken to the prophets of old. And God, we pray that you would cause us through the power of your spirit to live out the love of our king and humility on this earth. Lord, we look forward to the day when all the kingdoms of injustice and oppression and violence, when they finally meet their end, on the day you return. But until that day, God, may the hope that we have in you be alive in us. And may we be a people that reflect that to the world that we live in by the way that we choose to love and live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before you head out today, I um, just want to make you aware that we're going to be hosting our annual Mother's Day plant sale uh, this year. It's going to be done online. So if you go to our Facebook page, um, you can find all the information you need. My mom back earlier this year, I think back in February, started seeding some plants to get them ready for the sale, and she has a bunch of options. So if you go to our Facebook page, you can find the contact information for her. She's coordinating the whole thing, but all the money's going to be going to support the Find Out Free uh, Pregnancy Center this year. We thought it'd be a fun thing to be able to support them and, and raise funds for a, an organization that works with young mothers. And what a better time to do that than on Mother's Day. So um, we'd love for you to participate in this with us. We were going to try to uh, do the sale our first week back as a church, but obviously that didn't happen because we're still online. And, and to that end, um, we've been in a lot of discussions of our plan to come back to being able to meet our, in our building. There's a few things that we're looking at. Um, we're probably going to be doing it, laying out a couple steps this week um, for letting groups come back in. But hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, if things don't go sideways, we should be able to be back here all together. So just be looking for that update this week. Um, we'll be sending one out with some more information on that. But until then, love you, church. Hope you have an awesome Mother's Day, mothers, and we'll talk to you soon.